Welcome once again to our Bible study here at Bible Talk. Here being Saddleworth in England. We're at Tim Phoenix's house, joined by Tim, and of course my sweet patootie Alice. Hello there. <laughs> hey. And uh, we're continuing on in our study of the Sermon on the Mount. This is our 20th chapter, 20th week in the Sermon on the Mount. And we're just, we're blessed that you can join us. And as we, we start and continue in the study, we're in the, uh, studying the Sermon on the Mount in the Gospel of Matthew, from Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And uh, last week we were studying that prayer, commonly known as the Our Father. Mm -hmm. And that's where we'll pick up. But before we do, let me ask Tim if you would just ask the Lord's blessing on our time together today in this, in this session. Dear Lord, where two or three are gathered together in your name, we know you are with us. Uh, there's the three of us here, but we know there are an awful lot of people with us also, and we know that God is with us to help us. Amen. Amen. All right. As I said, we're continuing on. We'd, we'd finished most of the Our Father last week, just leaving off in the last verse, that last part of the verse. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So let's just take a look at that. For thine is the kingdom, for thine is the power, thine is the glory. It's all about what belongs to the Lord. It's important to know whose kingdom we're serving. Yes. For thine is the kingdom. Lest, like Solomon, we forget why the Lord has given and entrusted us with the gifts that he gives us to serve him in that kingdom. Um, whether it's wisdom or preaching or singing, whatever gift God has given you, the purpose is to serve His kingdom. And for Him to be glorified. And for, well, we'll get to that next. But we need to know whose kingdom it is. Right. You see, I mentioned like, like the wisdom of Solomon. Solomon had been given a wisdom that uh, is unsurpassed in history. That's what God said. It was this incredible gift of wisdom. And he gave it to Solomon so that Solomon could serve the people of God and build his kingdom. But interestingly enough, Solomon went awry. Solomon went off. And I just want to, like I said, it's important to understand whose kingdom, right? Yes. I want to read to you from Ecclesiastes chapter 2 in Scripture. And I'm just, I'll read first of all from Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verse 15. This is Solomon writing, and he said, Then I said to myself, As is the fate of the fool, it will also befall me. Why then have I been extremely wise? So in other words, God gave him this incredible gift of wisdom, but he came to a place where he forgot why he had been given the, mm -hmm. the, the wisdom. Now, how can that happen? Well, very simply, if you go to the, to the beginning of that chapter, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, listen to this. Again, Solomon, the wisest man, saying, I said to myself, Come now, I will test you with pleasure, so enjoy yourself. And behold, it too is futility. And he goes on in, in, uh, in verse 4. He says, I enlarged my works. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself, and I planted them in, all ki in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made ponds of water for myself, which to irrigate a forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves, and I had homeborn slaves. I also possessed flocks and herds larger than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. Also, I collected for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I provided for myself male and female singers and the pleasures of men of many concubines. And then I became great and increased more... You get this? All of a sudden, Solomon's focus is myself, myself, yeah. mm -hmm. myself. God had given him that wisdom, this great gift, so he could build the kingdom of God. Right. Mm -hmm. And now what he's happened is he's what's happened is he's building his own kingdom. Yeah. And this is where Solomon went off. And why in Ecclesiastes he goes on um, 
in, in verse 18, he says, Thus I hated all the fruit of my labor, for which I labored under the sun. He hated what the, the fruit of the work of his hands. This is the greatest example of pastoral burnout that the world has ever seen. Yeah. Right. And today, uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of people out there who are building congregations, but they're not building the kingdom of God, they're building their own little kingdoms. Yeah. Because they've forgotten. Because they have forgotten why God gave them the gift. Yeah. So whose kingdom? For thine is the kingdom. Yeah. We have to be always focused on the fact that it's God's kingdom that we serve and not our own. Mm -hmm. If you forget that, like Solomon did, you will certainly yeah, come to a place where your yeah. life is futile and vain. Yeah. And you will hate the labor of your life. Yeah, right. And that's, that's how you burn out, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And pastoral burnout, I know in the United States, is problem. one of the biggest problems. It's incredible. Yeah. I, uh, statistically, I think like 1,500 pastors leave the ministry every month in the United States. Mm. Why? Because for, for whatever reason, the pressure's on them to, to build their congregations. It's not it's about increase, their increase. congregation. It's about God's kingdom. For thine is the kingdom. And then he goes on to say, and thine is the power. Right? It's important to know whose power we have been entrusted with. Mm -hmm. Lest like those whom Jesus speaks of later in chapter 7, here, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Then we begin to take credit for the work that God is doing in us and through us. Mm. You know, in, in Acts chapter 3, I want to read this to you. Acts chapter 3, verse 12. Peter, remember he's done this great miracle. He said, but when Peter saw this, when people were giving him credit yeah. for the work that God had done mm -hmm. in a miracle, Peter says, he replied to the people, men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Or why do you gaze at us as if by our own power or piety we made this man walk, the cripple one. Remember mm -hmm. when he, he raised the cripple, silver and gold have I not? Right, right, right. People were astonished. But Peter said, it's not my power. Don't be amazed. No, it's no. not like I did this by my power. If you forget that it's God's power and you begin to start taking credit for these things like, you know, like you so get, many people do. You get puffed up, you full get of puffed, pride. Because the issue here is, like always, pride. Mm -hmm. Remember throughout this, we're talking mm -hmm. about the contrast, Jesus is contrasting what we are supposed to be living with what the Pharisees and the religious people are living so that they might be seen by men. So, we, you know, somebody said to me the other day, we're, we're here in England, mm -hmm. today it's a little chilly, a little rainy outside, which is fairly typical British weather for the time. It is. Um, for the past week we have had beautiful weather, sunny and warm, and, and that's... It's been kind of exceptional. So people have come up, you know, and, and said in the beginning conversation, oh, what a beautiful day. I said, yes, so you better give credit to the one who made it. That's right. Because the Word of God says, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will we'll rejoice in So if God made it, and you think it's a beautiful day, give credit to whom credit is due, so to speak, Amen. right? Amen. you got to remember who the, whose kingdom it is, whose power it is that does the things that, that we see. Then... It's important to know to whom belongs the glory, right? Less like the Israelites who presumed to control God during the time of Eli, remember when they fought with the Philistines, and they grabbed the Ark of the Covenant and carried it into battle, and the Philistines captured it. Mm -hmm. And they, they named a the child Ichabod. God, mm -hmm. And Ichabod is means the glory has departed. Because if you start mm. to take the glory for yourself, I promise you the glory of God will depart. For God is a jealous God. And we need to come to the place where, where in our prayers, in our prayer life, when we are conversing with God and talking about the things that He wants us to do, the things that we are, are, are in need of, that we bring before the Lord, mm -hmm. when we make our requests made known, mm -hmm. we have to remember that the kingdom belongs to God. The yes. power belongs to God. The glory belongs to God. Everything. Everything. It's um, all His. You know, I mentioned, because it's like, if you think that any of this is about you, then Jesus mentions later in this very sermon. Mm -hmm. And remember, I said, you have to take the Sermon on the Mount as one whole piece. It's not, not a separate thing at all, right? No. So in, chap in chapter 7, towards the end of this, 
Jesus talks about, he says, many will come to me on that day, talking of the day of judgment, mm -hmm. saying, Lord, Lord, look what I did in your name. Look what I did, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I cast out demons. I did this, I did that. You know what? We can't take credit for anything. No, all sure. of the power, all of the glory belong to Jesus Christ. It's about pride. If, how can you come into the presence of the living God, face to face for the first time, mm -hmm. and say to him, him who is standing there with outstretched, nail-scarred hands, and say to him, look what I did. That's yeah. pride, yes. right? When we come into his presence, we are going to be overwhelmed. We should be overwhelmed. We should be awestruck. We right. should be yeah. literally, uh, which is what, by the way, worship is. Yes. And if we come into his presence with, right. in worship, that means, you know, you're going you're gonna to be awestruck by the power, by the love, by the grace of God Almighty, and fall down before Him. And when you do fall down before Him, in that humility that comes from mm -hmm. being struck by the awe of God, mm -hmm. then you know what it says? Then He, he will, will lift you up. That's right. Yeah. That's right. All right? Okay. So at the end of this prayer, think about this. It began, this, this model for prayer that Jesus gave us. And remember I said... This is not the Lord's Prayer. No. If you want to see the Lord's Prayer, mm -hmm. go to John chapter 17 and look what He prayed in the garden before He went to, to the cross. The not prayer. my will, but Thy will be done. Right. But this is the, the church's prayer because this is the prayer that Jesus said, or the model for prayer that Jesus gave the church. Mm -hmm. But it's about giving glory and praise to God in the beginning. How will be mm -hmm. Thy name? And it ends that way. To, you know, thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. So it's praise and worship. It's praise. It's repentance. Right. And, praise if, you, and, and if this is the way you approach prayer, I want to read you this from Isaiah chapter 42, because it's important. I'm going to start in verse 10 of Isaiah 42. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing his praise from the end of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that is in it, you islands and those who dwell on them. Let the wilderness and its cities lift up their voices, the settlements where Kedar inhabits. Let the inhabits, inhabitants of Salah sing aloud. Let them shout for joy from the tops of the mountains. Let them give glory to the Lord and declare His praise in the coastlands. The Lord will go forth like a warrior. He will arouse His zeal like a man of war. He will utter a shout. Yes, He will raise a war cry. He will prevail against his enemies. You don't have any enemies. He has enemies. That's right. I, you know, mm, I, yeah. these, these are the enemies. And it says that when you give the glory to him, when you praise him, then he will go out. I hear all this teaching on spiritual warfare. I promise you, here in Isaiah 42, that's a description of spiritual warfare. When God goes forth to do the battle. It's mm. funny because this morning I was reading in Jeremiah and there's a verse that just jumped out at me. And it said, a clamor has come to the end of the earth, because the Lord has a controversy with the nations. Yeah, praise God, he has mm, a controversy, yeah. yeah. So this brings us back uh, to the place where God is in control. He has everything covered, all right? It, it ends in praise because we can trust God. Not because we're good debaters and can convince God. That's not what prayer is about. Yeah. You know, a lot of people, I mean, our attitudes going into prayer is like, we want to convince God that he should be nice and do something. You don't have to convince God of that. No. You know, he, did, you, did you ask him in the first place to send his son to earth, that he would be born in the fullness of no. time in Bethlehem? No. Did you ask him to send his son to the cross? He, no, he did that without your asking, didn't That's he? Right. So if he would not withhold yeah. his only begotten son, what do you think he would withhold from you? You don't need to plead with God to be graceful to you. Not at all. You don't need to plead with God to take your place in battle. All you need to do is sing His praises and give, give Him the glory. Give Him praise, give Him thanks, and okay. worship Him. Okay. What prayer should accomplish? I hear people pray, well, I prayed and I prayed and nothing happened. Mm. You know what prayer should accomplish? It should change your heart. That's, That's what right. prayer should accomplish. You're, you're looking for God to change your situation. If you start to think of prayer as, as a place you can go for God to change your heart, I mm. promise you will have an effective prayer life. That's, right. yeah, That's yeah. what I can tell you. Yeah. Okay. Now, last session, I talked a lot about the fact 
that when Christ tells us to pray this prayer, and this is a model, mm -hmm. and He says, forgive, uh, you know, that we forgive, forgive us, us our trespasses as we forgive others. I said, this is a dangerous prayer. Mm -hmm. All right? Mm. But now He goes on in the next verse, in verse starting in verse 14 and 15. For if... For, now think about that. For if. This is because, right? Mm -hmm. If you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Now, what does it take to be forgiven? The Word of God says, here's the deal. It takes re repentance, right? Changing our hearts, mm -hmm. right? That if we go before God, if we're faithful to confess our sins, He is faithful, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. To forgive. To forgive our sins. Is that sufficient? Just repent. I would say so, yeah. Change your mind. Well, but now think of what repentance means then. Repentance is us saying, okay, you know, we're, we're sorry for our sins. We're asking your forgiveness, Father, for those sins. Mm -hmm. But he's saying that it requires for us to forgive others. That's heavy duty stuff. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Because here's the deal you can go, you can go, quote unquote, confess your sins all day long. But if you hold unforgiveness in your heart towards others, what Jesus Christ is saying, and this is what he's saying, if you're a Bible believer, this is what he's saying in the Word. He says, well, then God's not going to forgive you. So yeah. is, your, is your forgiveness. Is God's forgiveness in your life conditional? Yes, yes it is. Yes. His love is unconditional. God loves you. But There's nothing yes. more important than His forgiveness because that's reconciliation to Him. Mm -hmm. And He is saying that His forgiveness requires that you change your mind. And part of changing your mind is not just saying, okay, I, I, want, I want to be doing different. It requires that you start giving that same grace that you are receiving to others. And you become a person of forgiveness. And there's so much scripture to attest to that. Yes, yes. But this is kind of Jesus' commentary. Because remember, you can't separate. And we tend to do this. Different verses in the, in the Bible and say, okay, they stand alone. Mm -hmm. This is one sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. But in chapter 5, we just heard Jesus say in 5, 23 and 24... Jesus said, therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, right. and there remember that your brother has something against you, right. leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother. Then come present your offering. So whether you have something against your brother, you know that your brother has something against you. God is saying, hey, in order, for, in order for you to be able to come to me, yeah. You've got to be reconciled to your brother. Mm -hmm. That's right. I'm going to say that I think that, I, and I've said, listen, I've said this for a long time. I, I see the biggest problem in the church as, as division. Yes. Mm -hmm. But yes. Well, let, me, let me tell you now that division is the fruit of unforgiveness. Yes, it is. Absolutely. Okay? Okay. All right? And unforgiveness is probably the single most dangerous thing in the Church of Jesus Christ today. Mm -hmm. yeah. Primarily because it creates a, that root of bitterness creates division in the body of Christ, mm -hmm. and it causes us to act unChrist-like. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Because nobody has offended you or hurt you or wronged you the way that we wronged God in our life in sin. Mm. Yeah. Never. Right. Okay. Yeah. Now, what's the root of all of this unforgiveness? Sin. sin. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Alice says sin. Well, that's the root of everything that's yes, wrong, it okay? Is. Uh, so you've got pretty well got that covered. There, there is an enemy of ours yes. who goes to and fro on the earth. His name is Satan, Satan. the adversary, all right? Yeah. God says in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 6, mm -hmm. starting in verse 16, He says, There are six things that the Lord hates, right. yea, even seven are an abomination. These are the things that are most hateful to God. And the first one is haughty eyes, pride. Mm -hmm. And I say mm -hmm. pride is the gateway to all sin. All right? It opens the door to all sin. But in verse 19, it says, this, God is, this is an abomination to God, 
is one who spreads strife among brothers. Well, what's for unforgiveness if it's not strife between brothers? Yes. Right? It, it, that's that's the problem. Now, you know, I've had I've done a lot of counseling over the last three and a half decades, and I've had people come to me. I've had husbands come to me, you know, and say, "Well, I love my wife. I, I love God, but I'm having a, I don't like my wife, you know, or mm -hmm. I love." Well, that's a lie in the pits of hell. Mm. Because listen to this verse from from John's first letter. This is First John. Chapter 4, verse 20 and 21. If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, mm -hmm. he's a liar. For the one who does mm -hmm. not love his brother whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. Yes. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Yes. Unforgiveness does not just bring division between you and that person. I'm telling you, what Jesus said is that unforgiveness brings division between you and God. Yeah. And ultimately that's Satan's purpose is to separate you from God. So you say, oh no, no, I love God. Well, the fact of the matter is in order for him to separate you from God, all he's got to do is separate you from your brother. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Let there be no division among you. One of the first results we see of sin in the very beginning when Adam, in, when Adam sinned in the garden, yeah. is it caused division? It, did, who did it cause division between? Everybody. The first thing yeah. he did was go and hide from God. It caused them mm -hmm. to be divided from God. And then when God comes along and says, uh, what's going on, Adam? That's a paraphrase. You know, and, and, Adam, and Adam, God doesn't accuse him, he just, but he asks the question. You know, what have you done? And Adam... Adam says, well, the woman that you gave me. So he immediately places the blame yeah. on both. But I, it's, whose fault is it? It's God's fault because he made Eve, and it's Eve's fault. You know. Mm -hmm. So there's three of them there. There's God, Adam, and Eve, and Adam is blaming everybody in sight. It's yeah. causing that division yeah. that not only separated him from God, but separated him from Eve. That's right. Right? Mm -hmm. That's what sin does. It separates us. The only thing that can heal that is we need not only to be reconciled to God, but be reconciled to our brothers. That's what Jesus said. Before you have I'm going to bring an offering to God, before you do that and you know that you got a problem with a brother, go be reconciled to your brother. Then come back. Yeah. All right? But you have no control when it, in that other scripture when you said in five where it says, if you if you know that your brother has something against you, go to him right. and try to and be reconciled. But you have no control over him. His response. Him forgiving you. That's right. But but you need to make the effort because right. it says be at peace with all men as, as much, much as, as it's in possible. your power. So you you have to make the effort to go and bring that reconciliation. Okay? That's uh, more, more or less relieving it from you. Taking yes, it does. Blood off I mean, God, listen, this is, there's so much teaching in the New Testament mm -hmm. on how to deal with this issue mm -hmm. of when you have strife in yes, the family yes. of God, and, and mm -hmm. when there's unforgiveness, mm -hmm. how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. um, and we need to understand how important this is. Let me, let's go ahead here a minute, and I want you to think about this. Okay. Okay. Satan is focused on dividing us yes. from one another. Right. Yeah. Right? Why is he so completely focused on dividing us? Remember, the Word of God says... Let there be no division among you. Because, right? because Jesus prayed for unity. Okay. When did he pray for unity? Just before he died. Just before he died. Th think about that. And I know I've shared this before, but I'm going to share it one more time. Um, years ago, I was preaching in, in Africa, and I was preaching to a, a large group of pastors. I'd been there for a week, uh, preaching at a conference. And on, on this last day, uh, or the day before the last day, I was preaching to a group of pastors, a large group of pastors. And the following day, they would be heading back from, we were in Cameroon, mm -hmm. uh, in the capital, Yonde. And they'd come from all over Africa. They'd come from Europe, and they'd come from the, actually, Caribbean countries, too. Um, and I said, think about this, you know. You're leaving here tomorrow, but what, what would happen, you pastors, men of prayer, yeah. what would happen if you knew with an absolute certainty if God spoke to you, you heard the roaring voice of God, and you knew with total certainty that this would be the last day 
full day that you would ever spend on the face of the earth? What if God gave you an absolute knowledge and certainty that tomorrow you'd be going to be in glory with Him? How would that affect your prayer life? And you well, want to know something? Oh, we, yeah, I, I think if we're honest with ourselves, and that was the case. You knew that today is your last day on earth. It would change your prayer life. All of a sudden, things that are many things that are important to you that consume your prayer life today mm -hmm. will have no importance whatsoever. Yes, right? Well, that's exactly where Jesus was when he went into the garden. He knew yeah. that it was yeah. over. After yeah. that Passover dinner, it was over. He was headed for the cross. He knew it. Yeah. And he went in to pray. What did he pray for? He prayed for our unity. That yes, we would be one. Isn't it? Yes. So if, if that focuses your prayer life and you get to the place where you're praying about that which is most important, think about Jesus in those last hours of life. What did he pray for? He prayed for our unity. Yeah. I want to. I just want to read this to you. This is actually, you know, I, I've mentioned it a number of times. I'm in the process of writing a book called "The Schemes of the Devil and the Triumph of Christ Jesus." Um, and the first scheme of the devil that I see, the wile of the devil, to attack the church, is division. Right. right? Yeah. I just want to give you some thoughts here. Our division, keeping us apart lessens the manifestation of the presence of God. Yes. Why? Because it's written, For where two or three have gathered together in my name, there I am in your midst. Yes. So, if, if his, there's this manifestation of God's presence in our gathering, if Satan can prevent us from gathering, divide us, Jesus will that manifestation there. is lessened. Right? Mm. right? Our division impedes our prayer life. We're talking about prayer. Yes. Now, I'm, these are not my opinions. I want to give you the Word of God. Yeah. Because in, again, in Matthew 18, Jesus said, Again I say to you, that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. Mm -hmm. So if we can come together and agree in prayer, yeah. there is that, ex that, that power of prayer. Yes. But if Satan can keep us apart, we'll not agree, we'll not come together and pray together. Yes. Peter, in his first letter, wrote this. You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker, since she is a woman, and show her honor and fellow heir of grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. Mm. If, if, husband, if you don't have a right relationship with your wife, Peter, the word of God is saying, your prayer life will be hindered. Yes, it makes sense. Think about, yeah. right? Our division weakens us. Yes. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 9 and 12. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. And if one can overpower him as alone, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. We are strengthened mm -hmm. in this unity. Right. So if Satan can divide us, he weakens us. Our division hampers our evangelism. Mm -hmm. You know, I hear all these people with all these programs about how to go out and evangelize. You know, how to go out into the... And, well, you know, what, you know something? All the, all the evangelistic programs in the world, mm -hmm. all of the inviting people in for donuts and hot dogs to your church building, all of the things that you're doing to, to quote-unquote evangelize. Think about this. Okay that they may all be one, this is what Jesus prayed in the garden, yes. that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Yep. That's one evangelism. of the reasons is that our unity shows and causes people to believe in Jesus Christ. Right. Therefore, our disunity causes people to disbelieve. Right. And all of our evangelistic programs cannot overcome our division because our division hides Jesus Christ from the world. Mm. Again, in John 17, Jesus said, I and them and you and me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Mm. Satan wants us divided so that the world will not see the presence of Jesus Christ in us. Mm. Our division slows or prevents 
God the Potter from perfecting us. Yeah. Yeah. Right now, His purpose, His promise is to bring us from glory to glory. Yeah. God's purpose in our lives, it says this, Paul wrote in Romans, he said, you know, that we have, whom He foreknew, He predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ Jesus. That's what the potter is doing. He's molding us, he's shaping us, but shaping us into what? Into the image of Jesus Christ. But it says in Proverbs 27, 17, that as iron sharpens iron, so one man another. All right? God perfects us in unity. Remember, that's what he just said in John 17. How does he perfect us? In this the relationship that we have with one another. Okay. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, listen to this. Paul says, Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, and that there be no divisions among you, that, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. We're made complete in this unity. And then John wrote in 1 John 4, 12, If we love one another, God abides in us, Listen, and his love is perfected in us. Yeah. If Satan can divide us, that prevents God's perfection from being accomplished in us. Yeah. Okay? Our division infects, infects, and affects our praise and our worship. Yes. Yeah. Romans 15, 5 and 6. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another, according to Christ Jesus, so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We need to have unity so that we glorify God, the Father, the way we're supposed to. Yeah. The vision prevents that from happening. And a house divided will not stand, stand. That's what Jesus said. Are you, I mean, I hope you're getting all of this. Mm -hmm. Because the root of this division is unforgiveness. And think yeah. about what division is doing. Our division hampers his ability to bless us yeah. by meeting our needs. Yeah. Right, right. Oh, you mean if we're not... If we're, yes, first of all, you can't come and give your offering to the Lord without letting him reconcile. But think about this. In Acts chapter 4, right? I'm going to read it starting in verse 32. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own. But all things were common property to them. And with great power the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And abundant grace was upon them all, for there was not a needy person among them. For all who were owners of land and houses would sell and bring the proceeds of sales. So the unity they have caused them to be in a place where there was no need. You see need in the body of Christ today? Yes. You certainly, most assuredly do. And one of the reasons is that we have tolerated allowing the, the enemy to divide us mm. by causing unforgiveness between us. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 13 to 15, He's talking about abundance. God gives abundance, right? For this, your abundance, is not for, the ease, is not for the ease of others and for your affliction, but by way of equality. At this present time, your abundance being a supply for their need, so that their abundance also may become a supply for your need, and there may be equality. As it is written, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little had no lack. Now, let me just try and give you this picture. I, this is my theology. And if you think I'm wrong, write to me. Office at BibleTalk.com If you think the Word of God is wrong, write to Jesus at Heaven.org. Okay. Because the Word of God is true. And what I'm giving you is the Word of God. Paul wrote to the Philippians and said, My God shall supply all of my needs through His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. I have a firm conviction because it's the word of God that he watches over to perform mm -hmm. that if I have a need in my life he will supply that thing that I need the thing that gets a little strange and uncommon in the church that I believe that God will supply the very thing I need but he's more likely to give it to somebody in my circle in you know in that 
in that fellowship that I'm supposed to have. Why? Why would he do that? If I'm the one with me, why would he give it to... Well, think about this. It's like, you know, we are fearfully and wonderfully made, it says in Psalm 139, and God reveals his divine nature through the things he's created. Yes. Mm -hmm. When my stomach gets hungry, uh, you know, it's my hand that picks up the food. Mm -hmm. It's my hand that delivers it to my mouth. It's my mouth that chews it and swallows it. It takes a lot of parts of the body mm -hmm. to get that food to my stomach. Yeah. You see, if God takes the thing that I need and gives it to Tim, for example, mm -hmm. Tim being that faithful brother that he's supposed to be, and us being in a right relationship, we'll see my need. Mm -hmm. Because we're, 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 we have a relationship of love where we care for one another, where we are praying for one another. Isn't this what the Word of God says we're yes. supposed to be doing? Yeah. So he'll see the need I have, and he, being the good Christian he is, will now, out of his abundance, because if God gave him the thing that I need, he didn't need it. That's abundance. Mm, yeah. That's riches. Mm. Even more than right? So out of his abundance, he'll be able to supply my need. Now two of us get blessed. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm not the only one that gets blessed by God supplying my need. Now two of us get blessed. And who gets blessed the most? Well, if you believe the Word of God, if you are indeed a Bible believer, you would do well to remember that Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Yes. So Tim will get blessed more than me, by being used of God for the glory of God to touch my life. Now, you know, that, that may sound like a long way around, but think about it, because it is absolutely scriptural, the yeah. way that the body of Christ is to function. Mm -hmm. But when we have division among us, here's what happens. When we don't have that right relationship with one another, and God takes that thing that I need and gives it to Brother John over there. And John says, oh boy, you know, God loves me a lot. He loves me more than everybody else because he's given me this abundance. I'm getting riches because God wants me rich. So now I have things above what I need. And you start keeping that for himself. You know what happens? His relationship with the Lord starts to go wrong. Yeah. And I'm still sitting here in need. And we're yeah. all messed up. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And it's all because we allow division in the body of Christ. Mm. And you know, the other thing about the being given the abundance is knowing that God is using you. He, mm. And it's not even what He's giving you to give away. It's not yours, it's His. Mm. And it's Absolutely. Something, you know, it, and it's just yeah. a, a blessing knowing that He's using me yeah. or using... A absolutely. Words. By the way, that's the way of, that's yeah. way of life. Yeah. Um, we did a teaching some time ago that it's actually uh, it's on the Bible Talk website, somewhere on the Bible Talk website, and the Emily Solomon website mm -hmm. about flowing in the in the yes. gifts of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And I use the example again because Paul talks in Romans about God, you know, revealing His divine nature through what He's created. Right. And one of the places you can see this in God's creation is in the land of that of God's choosing in Israel where the Jordan River flows from the north right. down into the Sea of Galilee, flows out of the Sea of Galilee, and goes down to the Dead Sea. And if you think about this, all right, the Sea of Galilee was a place of abundant life. Yes. All right? I mean, that's where you see much of Jesus' ministry, but you see the, a place, these are where the fishermen were. Mm -hmm. Why were the fishermen there? Because, because it was the abundant. sea was a place of abundant life. Mm -hmm. okay? mm -hmm. You go down to the Dead Sea, and guess what the Dead Sea is? Yeah. Dead. Why do you think they call it the Dead Sea? Mm. The difference between the two is that that living water, mm -hmm. so to speak, mm -hmm. that flows in the Jordan River, it flows into the Sea of Galilee, but then it flows out, out of the yeah. Sea of Galilee. That same water flows into the Dead Sea and doesn't go anyway. any place. Mm. It's like Seneca Well, where mm -hmm. the, the, it started to get stagnant because That's it right. got bogged up. Yeah, now, if you want to know about Seneca, well, you write to me at office at BibleTalk.com and I'll pass it along to Tim, who is our resident authority on Seneca Well in Saddleworth, England. That's another whole story. Okay. But if God has given you something, He has given it to you so that it can flow through you yeah. to touch other lives. Yeah. And that's where life is. We must that's be aware of that. Because, yes. Yeah. But if it comes into you like the Dead Sea and stops there, mm -hmm. It it's dies. a waste, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It yeah, does. It's a waste. So, so think about that. This is what happens with division. 
you know, when we separate ourselves, mm -hmm. if we dammed up the, the, the Sea of Galilee and separated ourselves from the rest, right. then it would, die. It, it would all die. That's right. Yeah. right. But that's the effect of division. And, and last, I want to do this. You know, and again, I said this is the absolute purpose of Satan. Not only does it separate us from our brethren, not only does it do all these things, hinder our prayer life and all the things that I've just mentioned, but it separates us from God. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Major. Satan's ultimate desire is to separate us from Jesus and thus from the Father because that's death. Yes. Mm -hmm. right? right? Separation from God is death. death. And he comes to kill. Mm. What we seem not to realize, but that the old devil knows well, is that it's a far easier task of separating believers from one another, and that accomplishes the purpose of separating That's us right. from Jesus. Mm, right. yeah. Because think of the words of Jesus in Matthew 25. The king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And the king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Yes. Or, he will say, mm. to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Because he will answer them and say, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Mm-hmm. So that separation, that unforgiveness, that, that broken relationship you have with other brothers and sisters is breaking your relationship with Jesus Christ. Yeah. And unforgiveness is such a horrible thing. It's just, you know, that's why the Word of God says, let there be, don't let any root of bitterness take hold in you. I, I want to start uh, with this. We, we divide because we take offense with other people. Mm. We take offense because they've done. We there's some perceived wrong that they've done to us. Mm -hmm. That's why you don't forgive them, because right. they've done me wrong, mm -hmm. right? Well, the fact that well, however, however they, however you perceive mm -hmm. that they have hurt you, mm -hmm. that's you know, you take offense at that, and when you fail to forgive, you hold on to that offense. Yes. Um, last year we were here in, in in England, and a woman came to me. And she had just been with a group, and they had gone to a conference on forgiveness mm -hmm. and on offense. And they were, I don't know what she heard or learned at this place, but I had my suspicions. Because she came to me and she said, well, you know, if somebody offends me, how am I supposed to deal with them? What am I supposed to do? What happened? What am I supposed to do if somebody offends me? And I said to her, repent. Well, I'm telling you, her joy dropped. She said, what do you mean I'm supposed to repent? Mm -hmm. Somebody offended me, I'm supposed to repent? Let's start with this truth of the Word of God. It says in Psalm 119, verse 165, Those who love thy law mm -hmm. shall have great peace, and nothing shall offend them. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the first thing you need to realize is that if, if you take offense at what somebody says or does to you, if you take offense... That's kind of an indication, a warning light, a buzzer going off in your life. It's saying you don't love God's word as much as you thought you did. Yeah, yeah. Now, that's a hard thing for our flesh to deal with. Mm. It's an incredibly hard thing for our flesh to deal with. Yes. Yeah. But our spirit shouldn't have any problem with it whatsoever. Because it says, you know, if somebody says something to you, they accuse you of something, and you're, here's the deal. Somebody accuses you of something or says something about you, or if he even gets back that they don't say it to you, but they've said it to somebody mm -hmm. else about you. Mm -hmm. There's only one or two possibilities. Either it's true or it's not true. Yeah. Somebody says you're a rat fink. Well, you're either a rat fink or you're not. I mean, you know, it's that simple. The first thing you should do is examine yourself. Because there is a possibility. Oh, just as, uh, you know, as impossible as it may seem, there's always that possibility. They're right. Mm. Maybe you are a rat fink. Maybe whatever they're accusing you of, maybe it's something that they see in your life that you're blind mm. to. So it's, Paul says, you know, let a man examine himself. Go examine yourself. Test yourself against the Word of God and see if there's truth in the thing that they're saying. And if there is truth, then repent of it. And bada-bing, mm. bada-boom, ching, it's gone. 
and it's dealt with and gone. Mm. If it's not Very true, yeah. then what harm is it doing to you? If it's not true, it says, you know, Paul wrote to Timothy, he says, show yourself approved unto God. God knows the truth. God is the truth. So if it's not true, it's not going to have any impact on your relationship with God. God, listen to me. I used to tell, you know, Alice and I, we, we have started in the past, we have started and run Christian schools mm -hmm. for children from, from kindergarten up to 12th grade. I used to tell the children, I used to teach the children, that it is as evil to receive gossip mm -hmm. right. as it is to give gossip. Yeah, that's right. And that's the truth. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what? Gossip is sewage. It's just, it's filth, it's sewage. Gossip is uh, absolutely hateful to God. It's sewage. Mm. So if you receive it, you're like a sewer sucker. It's like taking a straw to a cesspool. Yeah. Yeah. Here's a picture for you. Don't receive gossip. But God does not receive gossip. No, so if somebody is saying something about you and it's not true, it will not affect your relationship with God. That's right. And that's what matters. So get over it. And trust God. You can say, He is the defense of my life. You're precious in His sight. If people are saying things that are untrue about you, if they're accusing you of untruths, God will deal with it. Yeah. You don't have to. So don't get all in a, in a, in a, all riled up yeah. and go attacking. He is the defense of your life. We talked about this in the beginning in the Beatitudes. Mm -hmm. Blessed are the peacemakers. Let the peace start to reign in your heart. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? You don't have to go out and fight your own battles. You don't have, I mean, wh I read earlier, just a few minutes ago, in Isaiah 42, that if you praise Him, if you give Him the glory, the He'll be the one that goes out and fights the battles. Yeah. All right? Hey, but it gets to that place where you actually trust in Him. We're, we're fighting all these battles. The other thing is forgiveness. Now, we had an issue the other day, and we were talking about this, that where somebody did a perceived wrong, okay? And when we walk away from the situation, you know what? Forgive the guy and forget it. First thing is to remember, our warfare is not against flesh and blood, yeah, but against powers and principalities. The devil can use those people. That's a fact. But our warfare is not against those people. The battle is against the enemy, the devil, mm. the powers and principalities. So let it go. When you don't let it go, and you take it, and you let it, your mind dwell on it, mm. you sit there and you fume about it, and you, yeah. you know, what's happened is the devil has captured your mind. Yes. Mm. Yeah. For however long you dwell on that unforgiveness, mm -hmm. he has taken control of your life and your mind. Yeah. Yeah. We don't want to ever no, give no. control. No. He has taken your mind captive. Now, the way to deal, deal with that, the way to battle with that, is it says that we are to take thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. So we're to take our mind captive. It says we're to not to be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. So you have to choose. You can choose. It's always a matter of choice. God is pro-choice. He just tells you the right choices to make. He says, I set before you life and death. I set before you the blessings and the curse. Choose life. Mm. When you choose to forgive, it frees you. Mm. And the other, thing, the other thing with unforgiveness is there's physical uh, I'm going to get to that. We're gonna, uh, I'm mm. going to talk about that in just a second. Mm. But the thing is, it also free. You know, oftentimes, and I've, I've said this, God, God is so amazing. He is all powerful. Yes, he is. Mm -hmm. And yet he's given us the power to say no to him. And mm -hmm. oftentimes, God, what he wants and what he has shown from Genesis to Revelation, what God shows is that he wants to take control of our lives, mm -hmm. that we might have abundant life, yeah. have joy-filled life. So when you have a dispute with somebody, and you, boy, you get in there and you take care of that dispute, and you hold on and you take it, you know what? God sits back and says, okay, I'll let's see how you do with this. Yeah. Mm. Because your choice is either you deal with it yeah. or you forgive that person. And you, let, you, when you forgive that person, you're turning that person over to the Lord. If they're wrong, for the Lord to deal with them. And you're helping that situation by showing them the grace of God. Yeah. When you don't, and what Alice has said is, when you let a root of bitterness rise up and take, 
take hold in you. Remember, it's, you know, it says don't let a root of bitterness, yes, right. because that root, like any root out there, like a we'll weed, will start to grow yeah. and grow and grow. It'll simmer, it'll get worse and worse and worse. And literally, I have seen, I have seen people literally, physically twisted from That's unforgiveness. Right. Mm. And yeah. I have seen people when they forgave somebody, it was like, oh my goodness, a miraculous healing. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a miraculous healing, I'm telling you. For unforgiveness. It takes a great weight off your shoulders. Un it? Unforgiveness yes, is yes. a spiritual cancer. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It's a spiritual cancer that will grow and it will eat through you mm. and chew up your life mm. and consume you yeah. until you can let it go. How can you forgive those people? How did Jesus forgive the people who had unjustly called for his death? Mm -hmm. Who had put him on trial? How did he forgive Pontius Pilate, who said, I find no guilt in this man, Yet. and then said, crucify him? Mm -hmm. How could he forgive those Roman soldiers who mocked him, spit upon him, put a crown of thorns on his head? How could he forgive them and say, you know, that when they made him carry a cross, beaten as he was, up to that, hit, to that place of execution. Mm -hmm. How could he forgive those who drove nails through his feet and his mm -hmm. hands? Mm -hmm. And yet he hung on that cross and said, Father, forgive them. And I'm going to tell you something. If you think it was the Roman soldiers or Pontius Pilate or the Jews who called for his death, whose fault it was he went to the cross, mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you whose fault it was right now. It was my fault. Because he died on that cross for my sins. He had to die on the cross for mm -hmm. my sins because it was the only way that I could be reconciled to God the Father. Right. There was nothing that I could do to make myself right with God the Father. I couldn't go to church enough in a lifetime. I couldn't give enough of my possessions in a lifetime. I couldn't go around and do enough good deeds in a lifetime to make myself right with God the Father. Jesus Christ died on that cross to heal my sins mm. because he was in the process of forgiving me. You think it hurts you to forgive somebody? Mm. Mm. But Jesus said, Father, forgive them. And there was a Roman soldier. Let me tell you something. Roman soldiers were hard guys. Mm -hmm. These were hardened people. These were not mamby-pamby people. These were hardened, hardened people. And yet, a Roman soldier saw Jesus Christ Pray, Father, forgive them. And he said, truly this was the Son of God. If you want God to be seen in your life, let his grace be seen in your life. Right. The grace that he poured out on you when he forgave you, and the grace that he poured into you that gives you the power to forgive others. Yeah. For Paul says that the Love of God has been poured into our hearts through His Holy Spirit yes. in the letter to the Romans, chapter 5. God doesn't... Listen, I'm, I know how hard it is to forgive. Mm -hmm. We all do. Yes. Yeah. And you don't have the ability to do it except for the fact that you have the Holy Spirit yes. Yes. and you have the love power. of God. Yeah. Yeah. You have the power of God. You have the love of God. You have the ability of God. To forgive. There's no way we can do it on our own. He doesn't expect you to do it on your own. Yeah. All he expects is your willingness. That's right. yeah. All he needs is your willingness to surrender to him. If you want to find a way to get past forgiveness, I will give you the secret to it right now. And you know what? Like the song says, it is There's no, no secret. secret. Pray for your enemies. Where have I heard this before? Yeah. Oh my goodness gracious. Yeah. Here in the Sermon on the Mount. Mm. I'm telling you, this all is one piece. Mm. So when Jesus says that you're to pray for your enemies, that's how you can be free from unforgiveness. That's right. Because when you begin to pray for them, when you begin to love them, reach out with, even just in your prayer life, mm. with the love of Jesus Christ, and these people that have quote-unquote wronged you, and start to pray for them in the name of Jesus Christ. God will take the bitterness away. God will take the pain away. God will take the unforgiveness away and set heart. you free from right. the burden of unforgiveness. And there is no heavier burden than I know yeah, of I than the burden it's of true. unforgiveness. It's very, very true. Yeah. He wants to take that weight off your shoulders. He not only has given you the power, he has given you the example. 
Yeah. He's shown you how to do it. That's right. Blessed are the merciful. You have received mercy. Give mercy. Mm. Blessed are the humble. Don't let your pride get in the way and start talking about how you were wrong. Mm. Blessed are the peacemakers. Make peace in your heart with that person, whether they know it or not. That's For you right. serve the Prince of Peace. Mm -hmm. Blessed are those who are persecuted. I said this whole thing. The Sermon on the Mount is nothing more than commentary on the Beatitudes. Mm -hmm. God has set you free from the devil. You were in captivity to him until you were saved. He's still trying to get you back. He's still yes. trying to put you yes. under that bondage. Yeah. God will forgive you as you forgive others. Well, I, I think I, I don't want to go on into another subject because we're, we're kind of close to the end here right now. But I just, I don't know, I, I just want to say this. Unforgiveness is so painful. But, it, mm. you know, when you fail to forgive somebody else, it's not painful to them. 99% of the time, they don't even know, they don't that's, care. That's exactly mm. right. Yeah. Yeah. They're not even aware of They're the not even aware of the fact that you're yeah. so many. It's only painful to you. It's only bondage to you. And Jesus Christ is not trying to put a burden on you, another task. Oh, you better start forgiving him. He is trying to free you. From that burden and bondage of because unforgiveness. It consumes you. Because it consumes you and it can cripple you. Yes. Yeah. If you have something against somebody now, if you have something against a brother or sister, pray, now. pray for them. Yeah. Bless them. Mm. Bless those who curse you. That's what Jesus said here. Alright? Start start pray. Reach out mm. to them. And if you know that somebody has something against you, whether they're right or wrong. Try and be reconciled to that yeah. brother or sister. Think about what I just shared with you about the vision and what the vision does. Yeah. By the way, if, if you'd like, you write to me, honestly, at, at office at BibleTalk.com. If you would just like that list of what the vision does in a life, I'd be happy to send you that in an email. Just write to me and ask for it about, about the vision at office at BibleTalk.com. God wants to set you free from this because he wants you to have a joy-filled abundant life. And if you want to see miserable people, if you want to see people with no joy, mm. watch people who have no forgiveness. Right. Yeah. You will see the most unjoyful people that you've right. ever seen in your life. He wants to bless you. He wants to bless you abundantly. So, do something. And you know, if, if you can't go out and be reconciled and you may have had a problem with somebody years ago, thousands of miles yeah. apart, you yeah. can. You can reach out to the Lord about them yeah. right now yeah. and say first of all father forgive me for holding unforgiveness in my heart yeah. and father if they've done wrong I pray for you you forgive them yes. this is the way of Jesus Christ this was the way of Stephen when he was stoned to death yes. and prayed that that would not be held against those who were stoning him to death at the time it is the power of God it is the love of God it is the grace of God it is the mercy of God yeah. It is the glory of God. It is the kingdom of God. It is the power of God. To thine, thine, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. May the Lord our God bless you. May he use you this week for the glory of his name. And may you find that fullness of freedom that the Son has set us free for. In Jesus' name. Until next time, God bless you.